Welcome to this week's episode of Why Not Both, the podcast all about how our multiple passions inform our identity. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I am a musician and therapist in Los Angeles, and I also happen to be your host. This season, we're brought to you by Under the Radar Magazine, and our episodes are produced by Laura Studeris. If you like what you hear, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. You can also hang out with us on social media for all of our latest updates. We are at WNB the podcast, and that is on both Instagram and Twitter. This week, we were really excited to talk to Meg, aka US Girls, all about the creative process behind her upcoming album. I hope that you enjoy this week's interview. Welcome to Why Not Bold. Um, thank you thank so much you. for joining me. Uh, yes. I usually ask what is what it is you do, but what might be a better question to ask? I think to ask how you how do you like to spend your time? I feel that when people ask what do you do, it's mostly them them trying to fish for what you could possibly do for them, how they could benefit from what you do. Um, and it also implies that you do something. I just think that there's actually a lot to be said for doing nothing. I think it could possibly even be the most kind of radical form of protest is a real radical rest of doing nothing. <laughs> have, have you read Jenny O'Dell's book, How to Do Nothing? No, but I've heard about it and I, I would like to read it. Yes. That lit up a little Christmas tree in my brain when you said that. I was like, oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <sighs> it also reminds me of there's an Apple lyric about that, about doing nothing but sitting on the lawn because it's just what you must do. Yes. Or just breathing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think we do enough of that. And there's, my husband and I are always saying that we can't really think of anything more valuable than maybe a life of meditation. <laughs> like wow. if, it's, if that was what your life was centered around, which was slowing down and stopping time and just being present and observing thoughts and feelings and what's going on around you, just it would amass into something not only large, but also minute, it would be, you know, it would be that great um, kind of paradox, I think, that maybe we're all searching for without knowing. Well, it kind of speaks to, like, almost the elasticity of time. If, in a way, you can stretch it, but also make it smaller through meditation, it sounds like then in doing other activities that you could apply the same thing. Definitely. I think it's a real goal of mine to eliminate time you know to not really be too concerned with it which is you know that's not the world we live in especially not in the creative industries no <laughs> uh, really the opposite of that yes and there's an obsession with youth and like you know making it in your youth or something like this when that doesn't really make any sense to me if I feel like probably I'll be making my favorite things when I'm much, much older, if I get to live that long, you know? I I would have to agree. The older I get, I feel the more interesting, at least, my work becomes. And I trend towards enjoying artists who have made work throughout their lifetimes. Like, I enjoy looking Definitely. at the work that people have made, like, towards the end of their lives. Definitely. I mean, like, someone like a Yoko Ono is a perfect example of that. Yep. where she's always present and it's always her, her, she's, a, you always see her there, but she's changed so much and done so many things and worked in so many mediums that the medium that she works in has just turned into herself and yes. her life. Yes. Which is great. In a way, I feel that way about the diarist Anais Nin, where she essentially turned her life story into her life's creative work. Definitely. <laughs> I always found that fascinating that she did publish what are called the diaries that are based on what one could, I guess, approximate as a diary, but which were so heavily yeah. 
crafted and made into a narration. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I think there's a really rich history of that. I, and I think that women, I think women maybe do that best. Yeah, kind of weaving the threads into a narrative arc. Mm-hmm. Well, and maybe, yeah, and that li- and making life your 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 art or something. I mean, I think about my mother-in-law, who's a filmmaker, but she's also a mother and a caregiver, and like everything she does is part of her kind of expression of life and love, like the food she makes, the way she mm-hmm. decorates her house, the way she does her hair, the shoes she's going to wear, just everything is is a, a part of a larger piece. Mm-hmm. And I think that there should be more, you know, celebration of, of creativity that doesn't make money, you know? <laughs> right. Like you were saying, like, mm-hmm. instead of commodifying people, like, what do you do so that it's... A, yeah. You know, in a way that's I like that you kind of said that that's a veiled question of what can you do for me (laughs) yeah definitely (laughs) well I think that's often that's what's frustrating is that curiosity is often in our day and age very selfish Mm -hmm. and that's really not the point of curiosity curiosity is I feel like to learn about others in order to broaden your empathy and like you, you, you benefit from it as, as in the back end without mm-hmm. it being the, the main, the number one uh, takeaway from it, you know? It sounds almost like kind of like curiosity versus like discovery of something or inquiry. Sure. Oh. Sure. Well, discovery is such a complex word and concept due to, like how it's been used in colonialism, you know. I really like thought col- that right Christopher, after <laughs> Christopher discovered America and, you right. know, some scientists discovered this whatever substance. It's like, it, it's, yeah, I don't, I really just like that word. I think it's, it makes bad myths. Mm-hmm. I just, and it's also, I mean, it's so prevalent in the music industry. They call, you know, they call them discovery stories. Like, oh, this person was discovered in a bathroom singing or something. And it's like, like as if they didn't exist until that moment they were discovered. Yeah, yeah. that's, it's so interesting as you're saying that, because that was what I thought as it came out of my mouth that my brain went, oh no, you can't Columbus things, Pam. Um. <laughs> yeah, <there you> <laughs> I, was like, I mean, you well, can, and people do work. all the time, <laughs> you know, but it's good to for us to try and stop ourselves around that language and that stuff. I'm wondering what's a different word to use for that, for that, like, genuine inquiry into the world around you, as opposed to discovery for the point of either exploitation or, like you said, to create a false myth around a phenomenon or a person. I think curiosity I like the word curiosity more for that yeah it's just like it's make you have to check yourself while using it and make sure it's not a a uh curiosity that's like weighted towards your benefit it's more maybe for the benefit of listening to someone else Mm. curiosity that you remove yourself from or something I don't I don't not sure exactly how to put it, but yeah, I don't, I find that curiosity takes work too. It doesn't just, it's not just, it just appears to you and you're like, oh, I'm curious about that. I think it, right. you have to like do the work and critical thinking and be like, what would be the next step of if I want to look at this thing? Right. What other angle can I look at it from, you know? Um yeah, it's 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 very active. And I like that you connected that to people's attitudes towards people within music and even people in, I guess, any generative art sphere uh, where it's like, oh, we just discovered this new writer. And it's like, by the way, that person's been a writer for the last 20 years. 
(laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I get it constantly because most people only know my music since I started working with 4AD. So I sit Mm -hmm. in endless interviews where someone says, so this is your second record or your third record. Oh God. No, it's my seventh. (laughs) (laughs) And they're like, and they're like, what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well, it's this third one that matters. Like people have literally oh said God. that, and you're like, okay, I guess in your world, yeah, sure, sure. Wow, <laughs> it sounds like what they're saying is like it's the third one, and so it's it's those are the ones that matter to me because I knew about them. Well, yeah, and because they've been vouched for by this larger system, right. you know this this larger label and these media outlets that are the tastemakers or the gatekeepers, you know? So yeah, it's, it's frustrating. I'm, you know, I just, I mean, I'm able to laugh it off, but. I was going to say, what was, what was that changeover? Going to 4AD changeover? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I would say it, it's, I'm really grateful I was doing it as a, you know, a woman who was a, like, I, I think I was 30 mm-hmm. when I started working with them. And I'm really grateful that I was at least a baseline of 30. <laughs> <Think that laughs> nav, navigating this kind of realm, this level of the industry is got to be really difficult for a younger person. Mm -hmm. and especially a younger woman Mm -hmm. you know I really had a sense of myself I'd had so much experience that was not in this kind of zone that was more you know the kind of experimental arty kind of underground zone very human very lots of people just handshake deals dealing with each other driving Mm -hmm. people places you know that kind of thing I'd worked at that way for years and I really kind of, yeah, my my core around my ideas about industry and all that stuff was very fused. So I, you know, I'm I'm super skeptical of <laughs> this whole zone. But I'm also, I mean, working with them changed my life. I really right. genuinely like the people at 4AD and at Beggars. Mm-hmm. It's been so helpful. They've literally... You know, it's, I am able to, to have support, not only, you know, money support, but um, all kinds of resources through them that I have now Mm -hmm. has been, has been life-changing for me, for my partner, the people that I work with, it's helped facilitate music for other people, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, really uh it's been a good thing but i i don't i really try to not put to i try to make it that right <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. i want to be pleased with my albums and the work the, the things that i'm making and the the kind of only judges i listen to are 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 the people that i love right. you know what they what they feel that because they'll know all the things I've made and the kind of person I am. And they can tell me if they think I'm being genuine or if I push myself in this or not, if I'm being clear, if I'm, if I achieved, you know, the vision, Mm -hmm. anyone outside of that, I don't really listen to. (laughs) So, (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's much like I was talking to someone else about the phenomenon of like, that it's hard to take criticism from someone you don't really know. Because you're like, well, yeah. they don't really know me. So, like, it kind of doesn't matter. But conversely, it's high praise in the same way where you're like, you also kind of don't know me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, uh, criticism is, yeah, I don't think it's that helpful if the person doesn't know you, the way you work, your intentions. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, I just, I mean, I don't know. It's, and also criticism when there's maybe no, there's no ability to have a conversation, you know, like, I think that's kind of the issue or, or why I don't read, you know, I have a really hard line about, I don't read my own press. Right. And I, I turn comments off 
on, you know, I had the label turn the comments off on the social media and on the YouTubes and on and all this because it's, I if I'm not able to answer, and also, often those platforms comment sections are just places for hate. You know, just <laughs> yeah. Sadly, sadly, nothing happening here. There's no great conversation that's occurring, but you know, if someone's going to critique, that's what's so interesting about press or reviews, you know, mm -hmm. say you, someone reviews, comes to see your, your show and they review it and they give it a bad review. It's like, but you don't even know what was going on with me that day. Maybe our, our van broke down right. and I'm sick and I haven't shit in a week cause I've been on tour and I'm <laughs> <so> <laughs> poorly. And like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's all these yeah. things. And that's the same thing that comes around with any person, you know, I mean, you see people, you know, you'll see a person on the subway who's obviously having a hard time that like freaks out on someone, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, we're all like, oh my God, that person's a psycho. But it's like, you have no idea what that person's life has been like yeah. or, or how they've been treated and how they maybe have no trust and they're very skeptical of everyone around them or something terribly unfair happened to them that day. And they're just like, letting some steam off elsewhere like right it's all like we don't know anyone's context and so to to comment on on anyone is it's just not really yeah i think we need to just listen more than talk <laughs> but i don't know i don't know well and as you said it's the same thing that i'm really trying to stop myself with about commenting on people's appearances even oh. if it's positive you know what I mean? But like, to it can be hard for someone to hear like, oh, you look great. Like, if they don't feel that way, and they're struggling with their physical appearance, mm -hmm. that can really send like, and yes. also, to, it's like, to put so much stock in how something looks. Yes. You know, I, I'm just trying to not do that anymore. And it's really difficult, because it's a really easy thing to say It's like, oh, great whatever or I don't know but it's it's really not our place to comment on how someone else looks even if it's positive there was there was something I read about commenting not necessarily on how someone looks but on a choice they've made in regards to their appearance like saying like I really yeah. enjoy that scarf that you picked or yeah. like how you did your hair is epic like something like that where it's like something that someone had made the the purposeful choice to do something with their appearance as opposed to being like, you have pretty eyes. Like you're like, well, I didn't choose yeah. my eyeballs. <laughs> like, yes. Yes. They came yes. this way. <laughs> um, For sure. Yeah. Cause I like what you're saying that it's about, you know, you can't really see someone's previous experience much like a review no. of your show hasn't seen your experience. So in a way it sounds like they're actually reviewing their experience of your show as opposed to your experience, oh, yeah. anyone else's experience. Yes. Yes. I mean, that is so much, I think, of just kind of the world we live in, which is a, like a constant, con it, con constant content is needed. Yes. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really tricky. And, and to like with reviews or things like someone sees a show and they review it that next day. When it's like, I really find that when I see a show or I, or I watch a film, I need some days to, yeah, to digest it, process it. And sometimes something initially I was like, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't enjoy that or I didn't like that. But then it keeps, stays with me and it nags at me. And then I mm -hmm. start going into that feeling and I'm like, oh, whoa, mm -hmm. this is actually, that was actually, I didn't like it. No, but I, it is good because it made me think about this thing mm -hmm. and now it's like mm -hmm. I got something from it and so if I had made my judgment right away it, it yeah then then you're kind of like stuck with your judgment and it's so hard for us to say we were wrong or I, we change yeah. our mind you I know which is that. we should be free to be able to do that or free to say we made a mistake you yeah. know that that's a big thing that I think is missing I mean, and it, it comes from the total charade that is our justice system, you know, but it's like that someone maybe 
does does something that's harmful, hurtful to someone else, mm-hmm. and and then they're punished, you know, like this this, this punishment thing. Or, or not being able to tell on ourselves. It would be so much better if we could tell on ourselves and say, I did this thing. I need to find out why I did it. I made a mistake. I want to, like, make up for it, you know. But where, you know, it's there's such a risk to tell on yourself or reveal the kind of the bruised spots or the, like, for lack of a better word, negative spots about ourselves. So we repress, repress them. <laughs> and then they come out in some other mutated way later. Well, and in some ways, like, it's indicative of our culture that we have this culture of almost, like, doubling down on being wrong. Yeah. Um, For sure. I think that also some people may fear what will happen if they admit that they were wrong, because some people will be able to forgive that and be able to see, like, yeah. like we make mistakes. And some people won't. Like, some people are yeah. just, no, you messed up. Like, I can never forgive that. And that's okay. And what all mostly what matters too is how you feel about yourself. Right. You know, and so if you can forgive yourself, that's going to be that's going to be worth a lot. Yeah. Cuz I'm thinking about the scale of how one could forgive themselves. I'm like for some things I I'm like, yeah, I could definitely forgive myself some things and there are other things that I guess like I can't imagine doing something that I would find unforgivable as I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. But everyone's <laughs> going to have a different, de- different scale of that. Like, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's going to depend on what you've experienced thus far. So I don't think there's anything that's unforgivable. I don't think that there's anything that I don't really believe in like criminality or something. <laughs> I just uh-huh. don't. It's all, no one's born a criminal. No one's yeah. born like some creep businessman. No one's born a rapist. Uh, things happen to you, or you're put in situations or systems that that morph you into that. Right. And that is the real thing that should be looked at. Not that this person is evil. I don't think there's any evil or bad. What is evil is the ignoring things, repressing things, manipulating things, you know, but uh, I just, yeah, I don't, like, it's too, it's, life is just too psychedelic. <laughs> it's, too, it's too gray, you know, it's not yeah. black and white. I just, no. I think cr- crime is a one of these, it's just made up. Well, and also living in a made system. up to prop up a system, you know. Well, in a system that facilitates people who would act in criminal ways or harmful ways towards people, that you think that you can't yeah. get your needs met unless you act in this harmful way. For sure, for sure. And I think about mm-hmm. when you're saying about digesting, digesting art, digesting a show, really integrating it, even if you didn't like something, letting it kind of affect you taking that time um but also then as as a musician and as an artist what do you create that then helps shape that and that facilitates people taking time because it's like then in a way like yes we are making a lot of content but it's like then what kind of content do you want to put out yeah well that's i mean what kind of content do you want to put out is a whole bigger thing because I'm I find myself I have to make a lot of things that I wouldn't normally have made Mm -hmm. I I I wouldn't have done it on my own that sometimes is a good thing because it pushes me to do something I'm like wow actually I had to do something for this website and it ended up being really meaningful and like I like what came out Mm -hmm. but honestly a lot of the stuff that I end up having to do that wasn't my idea I feel that it's just fluff. <laughs> I just, and, and, and I and I wish I was strong enough to say like, no, I'm not going to do this. Like, because there is a pollute. I think we're we're living in a polluted time. Mm. You know, even just in terms of like cultural artifacts and just that kind of thing is it's is just so much, so so much. And in, I think intention really informs you know, the thing. Right. So, 
you can tell when someone's, you know, maybe making a movie because they're trying to make money or right. something, or because they have these people to answer to, you know, right. or you can tell when someone's making a movie because they're answering to themselves and they're answering to a, you know, an alarm that's going off or a phone call that's ringing inside of them that they're picking up. Mm-hmm. You really, I always can really feel, hear, or see a difference. Um, now being involved in the music industry at the level that I am, it requires, yeah, the manufacturing of a lot of things that are supposed to be passed off as my idea mm. or passed off as a, you know, valid thing when it's really, it's just some person on a press team or on something has come up with this. Right. And now I have to fill in the holes for the equation that they've presented. And it's, yeah, I definitely have made things that I, that I, I haven't then consumed Mm -hmm. because they were, you know, yeah. Whereas when I make a record, like I listen to my own records, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and in a way, it's. I like that you just admitted that because a lot of people are like, oh, I never listen to my stuff. And I'm like, I think everyone <laughs> actually secretly listens to their stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd want to. I would. That would mean I wasn't making something that I could stand behind if I didn't want to listen to it. Like, I'm, I only want to make the things that I want that I want to hear or see or yes. experience. <laughs> Why would I ask someone else to if I don't want to myself? <laughs> That was what I exactly have said prior, where it's like, why do I listen to my own music? Well, I made music that I wanted to listen to. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> yes. Do you, do you work in mediums outside of music? Like when you are creating things other than music, what is it that you're making? And do you make anything that's completely unrelated to your music? Definitely. I mean, I think, I don't, I wouldn't say completely unrelated because I really do feel that anything that I'm making is just part of me and my life. Mm -hmm. So it's never not related because it's just, I'm putting my essence into it, whether it's Mm -hmm. how I'm going to arrange the table for the dinner party of people that are coming over, like uh, is to me something I take great pleasure in. And yes. think about visually and how I want it to be. And it, and it's something that's for because it's for me and it's for the people that are coming over. And I want there to mm-hmm. be an experience and yes. this kind of thing. Um, but I would say the kind of zones that I work in most are collage. And mm-hmm. Something I've always done. And that does relate to music. But um because I really approach music the same way as the collage. It's kind of just putting pieces together to make a new whole. Mm. Um, but I I really enjoy working with collage. I, I find it really meditative. I find it completely free of needing to be, be something. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't often do anything with the collages, which <laughs> sounds funny. Because it's like, it's like that, that's another thing you hear. Like, well, what are you going to do with it? Right. You know, right. like, are you going to show it? Are you going to you gonna <laughs> distribute it? Are you going to post it? Are you going to do it? Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I'm just going to make it and have the experience of making it. And then I'm going to put it in a box. Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to take it apart later and make it into another collage, which is something I often do, which is reusing pieces for a new collage. Ooh. Yeah, I was, li- I was I really asking, love get the pieces for your collage and then you told me. <laughs> yeah, well, because it's so nice when you, you know, when you find like, say, a really great hand or something in an old book and you cut it out and it's like, you love it so much and it's such a beautiful printed piece or something that you can give it multiple lives and keep extending it and putting it in different contexts. By And with that, I just, you know, that's, I mostly use like, small pieces of double-sided tape for collage so that you can mm-hmm. easily take things up and move them later. Ooh. Yeah. What does it feel like to dissemble a collage that you've made? Like, do you have any attachment to like, it's oh, scary. but I really like this yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of times I, I'll scan them. Uh, I'll scan or I'll, or I'll take a photo. So it's like I have a remembrance of what that was. Mm-hmm. And then um, I 
yeah, we'll redo it. But it's not, I don't always do it. You know, there is sometimes when I have so much stuff piled on top of my scanner. And I'm just like, <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> yep. You're like, I, I remember the experience. That's good enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think it just, I don't know. It's, I, intention so important. I think, you know, and really putting yourself into everything that you do. I really, I really take it so seriously when I'm working on something, but then also I, I think we have to not be precious about things either, you know, <laughs> and act that or, or, and, and act like anything matters, you know, because meaning is real, but it's also not, you know, it's, it's fleeting, it's temporary. Um, we are meaning making machines while we're mm-hmm. here, but we all are here for such a short period of time. We don't even know what happens after you die. Just putting too much stock in anything, I think, is setting yourself up for kind of a, a heart a heartbreak. You know, I really feel that way even with people. I love my husband and I can't imagine not seeing him every day and Mm -hmm. smelling him and having him there. But I need to be working towards knowing that he is going to (laughs) die. He's going to go away just like I am, you know, and that that's okay. And that's natural. And that you can't hold someone so tight. You can't, you know, you, no matter how tight you try to keep someone to your chest, they, you can't keep them here. So it's a kind of a getting into that mindset of letting things go and being a little bit, you know, Zen is a thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone actually achieves pure Zen, but I think it's something to strive for. Well, and it's holding that paradox of that it's meaningful, but it's temporary and that we ascribe the meaning and we can enjoy that, but not get attached to it to the point that it like you set yourself up for a heartbreak. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really, yeah, I found it endlessly helpful to be kind of thinking more in that zone, even in terms of, you know, climate change Mm -hmm. and what's going on of like, yeah, it's the climate has changed. This is happening. This is, it's, we are on a course and to, and to understand that this is important. Yes, we should still try to change this or try and save this as best as we can but also that humans are part of something so much larger we aren't Mm -hmm. above it right (laughs) we are not the masters of the earth and that we're gonna have to go and it's okay that that's okay we we that nothing is forever nothing is set and just yeah i do a like a meditation a lot that's like where you're in your head, mm-hmm. it's like, it's a three level meditation. That's like, okay, this is me. Then you go to the next level. It's like, this is me and my immediate surroundings and the people mm-hmm. I know. And mm-hmm. the third is like, you go out to space. Wow. So it, what you can do is you can like take a problem. Say you're having a problem in your life and you put it in those three zones. So oftentimes the problem is most intense on the first level it can be also intense on that second one, but you put your problem out to space. It doesn't exist. It's right. Like, <laughs> it doesn't exist. It does. It doesn't even register. There's no scale or, right. or monitor it could, it could show up on because it is, you know, the space is so it's it's so vast that right. it disappears. I've really done that. It's worked a lot for me for like body dysmorphia and stuff mm-hmm. like <laughs> putting my body into space. It no longer exists. Right. Right. Because I was, I was thinking, I was like, I feel like there's a level 2.5, which would be like global, but then <laughs> space would be. <laughs> yeah. yes. And so even yeah. thinking globally, I'm like, does anyone on the globe care about the way my <laughs> hips look in this dress? <laughs> No. I'm like, I no. would go with no. No, that's probably not a global no. problem. <laughs> like, no, no. Even on level Definitely proper two not. as opposed to 2.5, also not a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's interesting what you said about like the impermanent 
epics of humans on the planet, which like, as we've seen, there have been different epics of different life on this planet. And it's like, yeah, yeah. humans, humans just uh, quite unintentionally gave the planet a bit of a nudge on a cycle that it's usually on anyway. Um, yeah. But nudged it. And and it reminded me of what we we're talking about of the, the we made an oopsie. Um, is it like half of us have been like, yeah, we made an oopsie. And the other half are like, nope, we're going to double down on being wrong. And then even go so far as to say this isn't happening. I'm like, guys, that is not. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's start now saying that we are wrong and go forward. Go from there. Know, <laughs> like, trying to be right. <laughs> doesn't make any, doesn't make any damn sense to me. Nope. Nope. And like, it's it's very interesting where it's just like, I, I do sometimes wonder at the psychology of people who, who won't admit any sort of culpability because we've all been culpable because we all live in the system that has right. nudged everything off balance. Well, I think it's just a slippery slope. You know, you start, you start looking at, especially something like climate change that it, it, it affects everything it's so it's a really um it hits all the points in someone's life I mean that you start looking at this stuff then it's like you very quickly you have to look like at your family Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like that's that is the thing that I have found that people are the most resistant to which is looking trying to look with an unbiased eye at one's own family Mm. and just be like, yeah, my parents fucked up or like, you know, but, but, but also like an, an acceptance that being a parent is first and foremost, a, it's a flawed gig. You are doomed (laughs) to like a failure. You know what I mean? It's, it's just the weirdest, kind of job you know it is it's, yes <laughs> but but it's like you know it's really hard to critique like what gave you life which I think is also like why people you know have a hard time critiquing religion perhaps right. and things like that and it's no that you you can you can say you can point out the negative and the positive of something yeah, like something and that odd, and you still love it. Yes, 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 and that was something that was became really important for me. Was like I had some traumatic experiences in my childhood that I would, for years, was just like, yeah, oh, my childhood is so fucked up, and it was always like that angle. Mm-hmm. Till one, like my husband started pointing out to me, like actually like you're so resilient because of what happened to you Mm. like that you actually positive things came from it like it made you it made like you and the path that you're on now like if these things hadn't happened to you you wouldn't be where you are or like it I realized what happened to me like the experiences I had formed my lens of 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 why I'm curious about things and skeptical about things. Mm-hmm. Why I always want to like look at every level, not just the surface level. Right. And so it's like, wow, okay, it's so much easier to carry those things around when it's they become so much lighter when I can say like, yeah, that happened to me. It was terrible, but also it's like it's me. And like now things are I'm like I'm I'm doing these things I enjoy and I'm using it as a fuel mm. for for something instead of like uh, I don't I don't know <laughs> like this yeah well it sounds rock like by, that I've just yeah, put on top uh, of me it sounds like by accepting it you're able to kind of in a way like utilize it and not I mean it sounds pithy to say heal because in in a way it's not healing one way or the other but it's just to accept that it was part of you and it is part of you and to use it and that life is suffering (laughs) like it's a classic like buddhist tenant or whatever but I really think it's true and I think that western culture in particular is gotten this obsession with happiness that it's just like that is mm-hmm. not the goal if you're happy all the all the time that means you're kind of frozen yeah you know it's like 
you've got to feel bad to appreciate feeling good and you got to have dynamics in life and and that's what makes it rich and vivid and like noteworthy and gives you stories to tell and share and right it, it's like to be happy all the time would be like you only ever eat cornflakes you know it's just like <laughs> that's all you eat and that's all you get to eat for the rest of your life and like that's it you know that's that sounds terrible I was going to say, that sounds like when you were describing being on stage, having not pooped for a week. And I was like, yeah, that, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you'd be like, yeah. but I'm great. I'm doing great. This is fine. <laughs> for sure. For sure. For sure. <gasps> and it sounds like. Well, and you don't like for someone to say, for me to like say that, like, yeah, I haven't had a bowel movement in a week. It's like, people don't want to hear that because they don't want to have to admit that they hadn't either. <laughs> You know what I mean? They're like, don't make me think of that. I've just been ignoring this, okay? I've just been ignoring this and like pretending that like it's fine to just drink coffee all day long and then booze at night. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. People yeah. get really mad at you when you reveal your stuff. Yes, because, because they're they like, have to think about because they're like, stuff. yeah, then they have to think about themselves and they're like, don't you dare make me hold up this mirror. Because <laughs> you're doing doesn't mean I'm gonna do it. Like people get so pissed off. They're like, you put that mirror down. <laughs> it's true, but but that's why I think it's that's why it's just good to do that work yourself and 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 live and just and present it. And you don't have to preach to people. You don't have to be like, you should really be doing this. You know, like I know I've been really, I have a tendency to do that. I think in my music previously I would be very preachy mm. and act like I had answers and like listen you gotta look at these facts like look at this and da, da, da. And I know I definitely have done that with my husband being like you really you know you really need to work on this thing like and being kind of you have to be yeah it's almost like you have to trick people into wanting <laughs> to do that kind of work or look at something you know and the best way to do it is just to be an example yourself and I like what you said about setting the table for dinner in much the same way that you spoke about your mother-in-law, just imbuing your intention in things and that people will catch on to your intention. Like, it sounds like you've observed her been like, ah, that, oh, yeah. like, I would like oh, to do yeah. that. She definitely is a person who came into my life that I have absorbed so much from that if I stop and think about it, I can, you know, she she's done food for me for like video shoots or recording sessions where she'll cater food. And like, wow. it comes with like beautiful, like notes on them, like U S girls menu with like, Ooh. she'll cut out like a cute lady and then like Ooh. write what's in, write what's in everything. And like with beautiful penmanship and just like, she takes time and there's, she really puts herself and puts love and intention in everything she does. And I mean, I think even when there's difficult moments with her, she's putting herself and love into it. You mm. know, it's love is, can be difficult too. Yes. So, yeah. And I was thinking about how to express all of that then through the medium of music, like how do you feel that your music has changed if you said that it was preachy in the past? Like how do you think it's changed now? <laughs> I, like, I think I, I mean, I've just really tried to start writing just from my experience mm. and what I can speak to. And I previously would do a lot of writing from like characters' experience. Mm. And I think I also used to think I could write for every woman about like the female experience. And I'm really grateful that I had some kind people say to me, like, no, you, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> not like, really no. how it works, you know? <laughs> I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, I'm, and, you know, my intentions were good, but it's like, no, go go a layer deeper. Yeah. Think about what you're saying. Yep. It's like, okay, yes, thank you for drawing my attention to that. And I can see now, yes. And all it meant was I need to focus more on myself, like, and that write what you know thing, it, that is a real thing. And it's the work, the music now is so in line with the personal work I'm doing and self-care mm -hmm. and self, ex, like 
the curiosity of myself and trying to not just walk blindly and be like, I don't know why I'm doing these things. I'm just being crazy. Like trying to understand and be kind to myself and accepting Mm. while trying to make adjustments. Um, Yeah. It's, it's also made me really the people that I work with. It's really informed how I work and thinking about, things like the hours that you set to work, you right. know, there's often, you know, it's like we're doing a 12 hour day and it's like, what, where the hell does that come from? That's like some capitalism stuff, you know <laughs> what I mean? Or like, just like having food at rehearsals always. Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm-hmm. people need to eat. We need to uh, eat. Yeah. And like people, I'm asking these people to come here and do this thing. Yes, I'm paying them. But I'm also asking them to come here and do this for me ostensibly. And say it needs to be basic food, basic care. Yeah. Um, And I really try to, I'm really, and that's something that I, you know, picked up from my mother-in-law too. She's a filmmaker and, you know, she really showed me the importance of feeding people. And not only that it's that people just need food, but that, it signals something to them, which is, I appreciate that you've come here to do this thing. I appreciate it so much. It's not just, I'm not just paying you. I, I'm caring about your I'm body. Caring for you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I, that's, thank you for saying that <laughs> because that's so much, <laughs> that's so much of what goes under the radar. That's really weird. Cause I didn't mean to say that on purpose about like the podcast I'm doing, but like it flies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It flies <laughs> under the radar because mm-hmm. people just either presume that it will be there or on yeah. the other hand, like valorize going through a 12 hour day and not working as though it's uh, not eating as though it's some sort of badge of honor. Yeah. And yeah. Bo- both of those options are not so good. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like no. n- neither one of those. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was just like, well, wow, okay, Pam, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like full disclosure, okay. this is a podcast that I started independently and then it got picked up by under the radar. So I'm still not used to being like, what do, I, what do I do? <laughs> like, <laughs> happening. Um, okay. Yes. And I was I was curious if you do any writing outside of music at all because you do seem like you've really thought through a lot of this. Yeah, I do. I I mean I've I I have a pers- very personal kind of reading and note taking practice that's very mm-hmm. extensive. I I mostly read nonfiction and I every book I read I take notes on. I I mark uh, points of interest in the book or things that I want to research more. Mm-hmm. At the end of the book, I then type up all those notes or scan them, and then I store them. And I don't know why I do this. <laughs> it's just something I started doing that was like making a personal library or something uh-huh. of of ideas and things to reference. And from that, um, a few like I guess in the summer I got contacted by a publisher that was like, you came up in our editorial meeting. Like, would you ever want to write a book? And I was like, okay, <laughs> <Try it." laughs> because I have all these notes. Like I have all this, I have a book. I have all this information that other, I would like to share. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, that's a project, a, a writing project that I'm working on right now. That's been so interesting because I, you know, this is, it wasn't something I, I saw it. Right. So I have no real framework that I have no, how I'm approaching it is that I want to try to create a book I've never seen before. Mm. And also trying to create within the book a bibliography that I am presenting as a gift to mm. whoever reads the book. That's so like, I've done all this this leg work <laughs> and I've presented it to you of like, here's my gift of like, check these things out. 
It will be interesting also reading your experience of the book because then it's it's informed by what you found interesting in the books. For sure, for sure. And I think trying to be transparent about that all we are is the sum of our experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, like the book I will write will contain inadvertently or or very uh, visually all the books I've read (laughs) and I should acknowledge them. You know, I, we live in such a time where it's like, you know, even for me, like so many people work on my records, but they don't get interviewed. I'm the one who gets interviewed. I get all the cultural capital, you know, it's all, and it's like, but this isn't really accurate. Like, (laughs) yeah, it's my ideas and I'm kind of the, you know, but it's like, it takes so many people to to make something and uh, trying to bring that into this book and be transparent in that way. Well, in a way you're becoming the figurehead of those ideas, but you're acknowledging that it's not just you. You're like, look at this. Is, yeah. I like the, in a way, the academic in me is like, I'm glad you're citing your sources. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Well, but, I mean, it brings up a whole nother kind of conversation even around sources that can be credited you know there's no way to credit an oral source exactly (laughs) you know and that that we've even moved away from anything being oral having any weight at all you know I mean case in point of like he said she said or like just like it's like only things that are in books that are printed and published hold any weight when it's you know, the actually being able to, to print something is so new in the history of human beings, you know, for much longer, it was orally things were passed down and and spread and shared. And that people value in a way, the memory that we form from reading something on a page, as opposed to the memory that we form from hearing something. Yes. Yes. Because I, yeah, I think to myself, I was like, there is, I'm sure there's a way to cite a speech, but then I thought about it and I was like, well, if you're citing a speech, it's, it's something oral, but it's something recorded. Yeah. I mean, how do you cite that your friend said this brilliant thing that like tore you up and made you, your brain shoot off into some other zone and, and start thinking about something differently, you know? Right. Right. Like you, you say that you can cite it by saying my name, then, you know, my friend said this, but like in the academic world or, or in the world of the artifact, maybe it's not gonna, it won't hold the same weight as when you have, you know, you can credit a page and a da da and all that. Right. right. To remedy this as a teenager, I, I used to carry around a tape recorder with me at school and I would have Amazing. my friends pass it around when I was in class so that they could record things on it. And, so so good. <laughs> and my friends, rec- there's like, I think that actually there's a recording of one of my, one of my friends took it into the bathroom and was singing while he was peeing. Like that was his contribution to the tape. So good. Yeah. (laughs) Have you ever read that book? Have you read that book talk by Linda Rosencrantz Mm -mm. or heard of it? It was written in like 66 or something, but it's just one summer her and her friends rent this house, like in, I don't know, on the Cape or something. And they just record all their conversations and the book is literally just a transcription wow. of their conversations. And it's so, so fun. It's wow. so fun to read. I really recommend it. That like NYRB book series or whatever, they, they put it out and it's, mm-hmm. it's one of my favorite books and I love the form of it. And I love that it's like her name is on it, but it's so apparent that they all wrote it. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. It's now great. we have, in some ways, we do have record of some of our conversations. In that, I I remember I actually I cried when my phone deleted by accident the text record with one of my best friends because it deleted over yes. text in an accidental swipe of a finger. Um, yep. And I knew that they were on her phone, uh, but yes. it made me so <laughs> it made me so sad. <laughs> well, how are you going to get that? What like can you print a text thread like? When I got rid of my smartphone, I had an iPhone and I got rid of it and I switched to it like a flip phone. Uh So, but I had the same number, but like my phone wasn't registering on 
people with iPhones. Oh my God. <laughs> like they, because it was like, it was all confused because it wasn't seeing me as an, so they couldn't, they would like get my message, but they couldn't send one back because it wouldn't deliver. It wasn't going blue. It needed to go green. <laughs> it needed to and go so green. I told like one of my dearest friends, Chris, who I have a, like, we communicate tons over text and had like a multi-year thread. Yes. I was like, you need to delete the thread and then it will recognize my phone. <gasps> he was like, I refuse. You know what I mean? He's like, <laughs> I can't, this is our relationship, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, but if you want our relationship to continue, you have to delete it. And it was like, <gasps> this, he was like, you, you know, when he did it, he's like, okay, I did it. Oh. It's gone. And he was like, oh. you know, he had looked through it and he was bringing up all these things that we had texted about him, funny pictures and stuff like that. But it was really an interesting experience. And now I, and I did it then too. I only kept certain threads, but now I don't keep any threads. Wow. I don't do it anymore. My phone is actually too, it's too crappy. It like also starts like short circuiting. I was going to say too much, if you keep too much on it in oh, there. Excuse me. But, um, and I like can't even really get pictures anymore. I can only get pictures from non iPhones, but mm-hmm. I just, I don't keep it anymore. It's just like, I, I yeah, I want to be free of that. Wow. I was like, that's liberating and also terrifying in the same way you were talking about dissembling collages. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it also is just makes, things a little bit more difficult like I can't look back on a on some information someone like someone's address you know someone sends you their address and it yes. would be in the thread so you don't have to ask them again and I'm always like where do you live again <laughs> what's, your, what's your apartment number again they're like can't you just look back on the thread I'm like no I don't keep it actually no <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my goodness that's I didn't even thought of that because yeah it was actually her uh her boyfriend at the time joked that he was going to print the conversation that we had as a gift to us both because we were always texting each other. <laughs> he, yes. he was like, well, you two clearly love each other so much. Like I should just print a book of this for you <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, man. And now oh I'm like, my gosh. Oh, someone did make a book of this. Oh, now I have to. Read yeah. this. And it's just called talk. Yeah. It's so good. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us on Why Not Both. I feel like we talked about Why Not Multitudes. Yes, thank you. (laughs) It was a pleasure, and I really appreciate your time. Yes, thanks for talking with me. And read that book. I'm going to read that book. I'm an an avid reader of books, so I'm very excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Why Not Both. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. The more you review us, the more it helps us out so other people can find us too. You can also hang out with us on social media. We are at WNB, the podcast on both Instagram and Twitter. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print music and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Thank you so much again to our producer, Laura Studeris, and for everyone listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I look forward to the next one.